So thank you all for your patience. Thank you all for attending once again. Um, and I am going to pass this on to Mr. Roy Shuffle, who uh, will then take you on all outside to take a look at that wonderful wall that they built just a few days ago. So don't lean on it, please. The truth of the matter is that when she found out I went to Penn State, I was told to leave the room and to do an outdoor presentation. A um, couple clarifications from earlier today. Number one, there are CDs here for your use that have all the compatibility letters between through wall flashing and anything you have in the cavity wall. All the letters from all the manufacturers are there. Secondary, if you, secondarily, if you need a binder, there's a full binder here on the different flashing systems we spoke about. Many years ago, and I do mean 10 years ago, February 2002, AIA at the old Sheraton in McAllen had a moisture management seminar. In that regard, I introduced this wall system. This wall system went a long way to ending the mold problems here in the valley. Little did I know that this wall system would be called the perfect wall or the wall that worked everywhere, and that's by CSI and AIA. This wall system is now the new national code, period. It answers the mold, mildew, condensation, and energy efficiency. We will be showing you this wall outside later on today, probably in 45 minutes. But literally, this sample's 10 years old. It's beat to death. It's meant to be beaten to death, but I love this thing. It's one of those uh, engineering items. Today's presentation is HSWSD rated. As is required by AIA, please evaluate me, not mentally, but evaluate the speaker in the program. And we'll begin. Are there any questions from anyone before I start on the flashing? Because the flashing feeds into this. Any questions at all? So far, so good. This is a provider program from AIA. And what I'm going to do today is go through all the changes that occur, air barrier systems, what they do to the environment, what they do to the building owner, and what they do to the occupants. One of the programs earlier today talked about indoor air quality. That's getting to be a bigger part of LEED. Indoor air quality is important. We're going to discuss performance and test standards to give you an idea of what's out there. And not that anyone, you know, all advertising, all advertising is completely true. It's just never truly complete. So I'm going to give you some keys to look at today of how you should evaluate it. Your checklist should already be in your bag. that You'll be able to go down and check to see who's doing what. So I'm going to discuss the performance testing and also NFPA 285 fire test, which is now code for type 1, 2, 3, and 4 buildings, i.e. 97% of what we build. I'm going to look at the IECC 2012 and the ASHRAE 90.1 and their impact on air barrier systems. We're going to go a little bit further. I'm going to try and share with you how we should properly develop a specification for an air barrier system a three-part non-proprietary performance specification. And right now I can tell you that air barriers is a very big growth market area for product manufacturers and you have all sorts of people diving in without testing. Air barrier materials, it's designed to provide the primary function of controlling the air movement through the building assembly. Do not, do not confuse air movement with moisture vapor transmission. Moisture vapor transmission or perm rating is a factor of one. Air movement or air pressure, like we're getting today with 35 mile an hour winds, can put in 32 to 36 times more pollutants and moisture into your building than just moisture vapor transmission alone. To qualify as an air barrier, you have certain ratings. 0 0.004 CFM per square foot, at that rating, it's ASTM E2178. That is the basis of the beginning of the air barriers. The city of Austin and many other cities around have this situation so that you get a rebate from the power company if your system can meet that. 
And the air barrier system here is the dark black material. It's not damp proofing. And the air barrier system on this one is a light Carolina blue. And they're normally liquid applied, but there are various versions of it. They block air. They do not necessarily block moisture vapor. So with that said, that 2178 test is a good start. But I am here to tell you that I took literally cheesecloth and jiffy, creamy peanut butter and it passed that test. That's how low a requirement or an engineering requirement is for that test. So you have that as one test, 2178. That's in your packet of information. Air barrier components, and this is where one of the contractors had some questions today. The air barrier component is a material to make the connection between the primary air barrier, i.e. the black and blue stuff, and the tapes and sealants. This being a typical framing of the window where you've got to have this. That starts the air barrier components. You then go to an air barrier assembly. This is a project up in the city of Austin. And in that regard, it's a large project. It is a full air barrier system, which includes sealing the joints, the air barrier material, which in this case was liquid applied, the fenestration taping, and the final testing of everything. It's a very rigorous test procedure in all this. Actually, that blue line that you see there is a caulking material. It is required by code. It has been required by code since 2006. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hugely important. To everyone in this room, this is where the cost of construction just went up. Yes. I'm going to get to it. But I know your concerns. It can be installed incorrectly very quickly. And let, let me go a little bit further. I think I, I have some of the slides that will address your, your questions. Your cavity is going to be behind this two by four on this side. And this is what it would look like. That's your cavity. You have your internal studs, exterior gypsum sheathing, your joint sealant, your air barrier, and the new requirement, continuous insulative sheathing. It's all changed. And you can't mix and match, which is why we wanted to do the flashing presentation first and then go to this. It will all become as clear as mud when I get to the end of this, just so you're aware of it. You have to combine the air barrier materials and the air barrier components as they were tested. To the architects in the room, you can't write your standard specs anymore. It's, it's not a situation where you can borrow from previous technology. You've got to go right to the source. This is the Omni building in Austin. The air barrier assembly is everything that's there. And it's tested that way with the fenestrations, with the brick ties, with the holes in the wall. An air barrier in South Texas will save 23% energy. 23%, which feeds you into the LEED program if you're going for a certified building. You're going to be playing in the section known as energy and atmosphere. And that's a 19 point area to which this can contribute a large amount of points. It also contributes to a large amount of indoor air quality points. So be aware of the things that are changing. Uh, we want the, the benefits of the air barrier system to the environment, the building owners and the occupants. They're various in many. There's a huge distinction between what they're doing up north and what they're doing down here. When I introduced that wall system 10 years ago, I was considered a heretic because that breathed moisture and everything everyone had learned was you needed a vapor barrier and not a vapor retarder. That's a vapor retarder. That breathes moisture vapor. That was heresy. That's another one where I got a bunch of letters from different corporate lawyers. But it works. And it works for the following reason. While the air barrier is breathable for moisture permeance, 
the insulation isn't. So we created the dew point, the theoretical dew point in the insulation, not in the living space. Because the R13 insulation that you had between those steel studs, after years and years of study, was never R13. It was R6. If you look at the new codes, if you are 13 in your steel stud construction, the effective R value is R6. No one knew these things before. We did, we shared them. Um, so there's a lot of things going on all at one time. We have been invited back, or at least at this point, we've been invited back uh, on July 25th, one day before my 39th birthday, but July 25th, a credibility problem? <laughs> <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Thanks for the backup. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll be back here to talk, talk about cavity walls and, and how to design them and, and get them to be the right R value. And this is where, Bob, I come back to the question you asked earlier. Since all the energy code started, not one steel stud cavity wall was built properly in Texas until this system took hold. It never had the R value and the HVAC, where's my HVAC guy? And the H, and you were calculating off of that R13, you never had an R13, you had an R6, hence you had the mold, mildew, constant, and, and uh, condensation problem. And of course, how many other HVAC people are here? One, okay, three out of 80. That's why they blamed you. But no, it's very true, you never had the R value you thought you had to start with. Uh, there's an awful lot of benefits. You do conserve a tremendous amount of energy. Down here, it's 20 to 23 percent. Up north, it's about 40 percent. And it has to do with the conditioned air leaving the building. You spend a bunch of money to condition the air down here, then it leaves the building through the wall. If you keep it in there, you keep all those dollars inside of the building. There is, and I know I got GCs here, lower initial construction costs, believe it or not. Now, I know that seems like a, a statement fraught with peril, but if you put the air barrier on at the beginning, you have six months to close it up, you have a six month working window, and your building is already dried in for six months. There are other things that come into that lower initial cost. Reduced maintenance cost, because, and this is according to DOE, this is third party data, it can reduce the energy 40%, but as importantly, it reduces air leakage by 83%. No air leakage. Your conditioned dollars stay in your building. Reduces gas consumption by 40 and electric consumption by 25%. The lower initial costs come from not only scheduling property, which is always a problem on a job, but since your mechanical units aren't running as much, you will save money there or you can use a smaller mechanical unit because your air exchanges are going to be down to three. We've done this in California. We were down to three air exchanges in an hour with no change in indoor air quality, contaminants, temperature, or humidity because it is now contained. The previous complaints in the late 80s, early 90s, and up until about 2002 were that we built our buildings too tight. And that's what caused the mold problem. No, it wasn't. We built them two in, in the middle, and we built them with bad science. Bad science promulgated by a lot of different people, including the federal government, who mandated a lot of this without looking how all these materials are interrelated. So that's why today you heard me speak of flashing systems and air barrier systems. Not components, not individual parts and pieces, but systems, and they are a system. Because you've got to tie the air barrier into your flashing and you're flashing an air barrier into your window, you have to tie all that back into your insulation value that you're trying to achieve. It's no longer standalone. The wall is now a dynamic system, not a series of components. Less maintenance cost, if you kept the unit the same size as designed, you'll have less strain on it. It's not running as much. You'll have less corrosion, you'll have less mold growth because the vapor's not getting into the building. An effective air barrier keeps out all the pollutants and allergens out of the building. And it can lead to healthier, more productive employees. As an owner of my company, Bob, Lewis, you know, we could all hope for that, more productive employees. Uh, fewer sick days, fewer doctor visits, and more alert employees. My guys are mostly jocks. I don't use that bottom one too much. With that, you heard the speaker this morning talk about indoor air quality. It's huge in the new LEED program. 
some of these air barriers, they have had the building literally 50 feet from a, a highway like in Philadelphia or New York, like I-95. And they had better indoor air quality than one of the suburban schools did because it keeps the pollutants and the mold and the mildew out. ASTM E2178, as I referred to earlier, that is the bottom line test. And that is the first test you'll see listed in anything. In that regard, this is the whole apparatus. You put the material, and this is a material test only. You put the material there, pump in 1.56 pounds per square foot of pressure, that's it. Take your reading, make sure it's below 0 .004 cubic feet per minute per square foot. I'm telling you again, personally, cheesecloth, jiffy, creamy peanut butter passed this test because we did it at my laboratory. This is the big test. This is ASTM E2357. This is the base of all air barrier systems testing. If you're VE or if you're spec or if you're alternate does not include this test, you're not going to get what you need. You're wasting money. And in that regard, it is a full-scale test of the wall. I have been out to that testing laboratory. It's a very rigorous test. It will blow that wall up to 99 mile per hour wind and cycle it on both sides two to 3,000 times. And they measure this constantly. There's little units. And this is why this test is important. Look at how real world that is. You have penetra penetrations, you have fenestrations, you have brick ties throughout, and you have joints. Very few people pass this test. The engineering requirements are huge. There, within this test, there are two other tests, though. One on a flat wall, no joints, and one on a flat wall with joints, but no penetrations. Once again, all advertising is completely true, not truly complete. That's what it looks like. That particular test sample was put together by Aaron Wood. Aaron will be speaking to you at the mock-up outside. Aaron was real big in going over to Florida in January and February. He seemed to like that. Different fishing season over there. Had no trouble getting them to go at that time of the year. But take a look at that. To answer your question, you can see the windows are taped. And they're caulked. All the joints are caulked. No tape on this, caulk, engineered caulk. That's a polyether caulk on that one. Your most critical item, and here's where I see an awful lot of mistakes being made and an awful lot of health and safety issues coming about. And I'm not referring to the lead or a green building. NFPA 285, mandatory test. And I am here to state very openly, no asphaltic air barrier no asphaltic air barrier has ever passed this test. And yet think to yourself, how many asphaltic air barriers are out there right now? Because? The entire wall assembly test is pretty rigorous. And it looks like this, it bursts into flames. So we should just never use Yeah, pretty much so. Now, uh, you, a lot of people are going to the uh, The acrylic types. Should it still be used for basement applications of more than some No. The walls oh, on basements, yes, because you have two non-combustible surfaces. And what this comes into is that assembly there. And I've had materials tested, and some of the commonly used materials in the Valley, San Antonio, and Corpus are in violation of the code. I will state once again on my website, non-proprietary three-part CSI specs, where all this is handled. And the checklist that's in your package, it's also there if someone makes a substitution request to you. I've tried to take as much headache out of this as was humanly possible. But this is the test, and it's 30 minute test on a full scale two story wall assembly. And I've been involved in a lot of testing recently. This testing came out from uh, Las Vegas. I didn't go to Las Vegas, but it came out of the MGM fires in Las Vegas. It had an EAF system on there, and the balls of fire were blowing out the wall. And that's where this test came from. Anytime there's foam plastic shoes. Yes? All building codes, especially NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. 
for types one, two, three, and four construction, which pretty much covers 90, I want to say 97% of what we build. And of course, this isn't happening, and you see it happening here in the valley. So what are the ramifications, implications, and it does happen? There are several architects in this room that I know designed to this standard, and they're fine. What happens is you have a building that if there is a fire event and there's loss of life, there's going to be a lawsuit. You're in violation of the code. This is a huge and rigorous test. It's sort of neat to see it. The ASTM 2357 test costs fifteen dollars to $18,000 a test. This particular test about $75,000. So that's why you're not getting a lot of players doing the right testing. And you have to go back and double check with everyone. Now I will tell you, I know Innovative Block is one of your sponsors, but they have all this information already contained at their firm. Why? Because David is a nudge. Okay, David, we get back there, he's a nudge. He wants all the data, he wants it in his file. So he's got it all already. But you can see the destruction. I mean, that is a rigorous fire test. And it's meant to be conducted exactly that way. Examining new codes, and these new codes are green codes, make no doubt about it. Your world has changed horribly if you're a contractor. If you're an architect, it's changed worse because you have a whole new set of materials to deal with. And you're going to have to go through the same process you all did when single plies came out. And you're going to have to weed out which ones are which. The way this thing looks, and I tried to represent this graphically, and that is Penn State blue on this chart. ASHRAE 90.1-2010 is the basis of your whole code. From that, you go up to the two testing standards, the 2178, which is air barrier materials, and the 2357, which is the entire system, the entire wall. It grows from there into the ABAA fully evaluated system. The ABAA, Air Barrier Association of America, I'm on their board, and we've had to bounce back a lot of test results already to different manufacturers. But they are the final authority in all this because they take the testing beyond just those tests. Going back to this, from the ABAA, then you go to the International Green Conservation Code, which we referenced earlier, and the LEED 3.1. All this feeds into the new LEED program. There is a legal argument out there about this, and it's been published, legal opinion has been rendered. The rendering of the legal departments, various firms state that if ASHRAE 90.1 changes because it is the basis of all codes, all codes then change. That's for the lawyers to decide. What I'm telling you is that, that ASHRAE 90.1 has gone all the way through and up and is the new lead program and probably will be baseline, which means continuous insulative sheathing and air barriers will also be baseline. Upgrading costs, probably $7.50 a square foot on the wall only in, in that arena. The ASHRAE 90.1, I pulled it right down. This is exactly what they have written. As you can see, they referenced the 2357 test or the 2178 test, depending on design criteria. The IECC 2012, a continuous air barrier shall be provided throughout the building thermal envelope. There's no quibbling about that, a continuous air barrier, not caulking here or there, not damp proofing. Damp proofing is dead. Asphaltic, emulsified asphalt damp proofing, ASTM D1227 is dead. That is not an air barrier material. Neither is perlite, neither is a lot of the house wraps an air barrier material. They don't pass all the tests. You're also going to have a situation, as you see, where the IECC 2012, it's based on the ASHRAE 90.1. All air leakages must be stopped. Not a choice. The IGCC, that's the first code coming out. As I stated in there, it should be out at the end of the month. It has been adopted by 17 states already, and it's not even finished. It is the new Bible, unfortunately. It does do a lot of things differently. It does not rely on certified forestry wood or things of that nature. It's more of a performance-oriented material. All joints, seams, penetration, site-built windows, which goes back to your question. And 
openings, utility penetrations, transition membranes between roof and wall, all have to be part of this and, and looked at. The ABAA, I urge you to go to your website. I was dealing with a gentleman in Dallas, for whatever reason, he, he questioned a lot of what I said, and that Italian side of me came out. Uh, we stopped the presentation, we plugged in the air card, we pulled up the ABAA site, and he had a Fortune 50 firm in his office the day before. And he said, absolutely, we are a fully evaluated system. Well, we pulled up the website, they weren't listed. Didn't do them a lot of credibility, but this is one of your, your checks and balances, which is why you have that six question sheet in your, your green packages to be able to double check. Also, the ABAA has a quality assurance program. Cost about nine cents a square foot, by the way. But in my specs that I have developed on my website, non-proprietary, you will see where you can call for an ABAA evaluated system to be installed and an ABAA certified contractor. That's your quality control item. And you won't get gray hair and you won't get no hair. It'll be a little bit easier on you. Um, I mentioned before the ABAA goes beyond what everyone else does. And there's a reason for that. The architects, the designers, the HVAC, the contractors, you're not just putting in a wall, you're putting in a system. And in the case of a, a um, approved air barrier system, they do evaluate other properties like nail seal ability or self-sealing ability. There's a lot of people that didn't pass that test. So you're getting, when I spoke earlier of a WR Grace type of phenomenon, the self-sealing or nail seal ability, they've done that testing for liquid applies and for sheet applies. But the house wrap people and the foam people don't want that in there. So internal battle. Pull adhesion, what is your strength of adhesion to the test? For those of you who worked, me, worked with me here in the Valley early on, we used to use the Florida test, the TAS Florida test for pull adhesion to CMU. They've evolved out into a full ASTM now. Same with the crack bridging. Doesn't pertain too much to us down here, but a lot of people went and ran up and marketed in Maine and Massachusetts and Wisconsin. Well, you can't take technology from Texas that's built for high temperatures and put it into that type of climate, and a lot of the joints broke open. So you have to you know, be local with your, with your technology is what I'm saying. Water vapor transmission, crack bridging, all these things are evaluated as part of that ABAA system, not just the one test. Lead, lead is changing. Lead is going to be very big, much bigger than it has been. It has become more of a performance document this year as opposed to a prescriptive or agendized document. So it's a big change, should be out in September. This version of LEED is much more to my liking. I can work with it. I can pretty much understand it. And designing with it is very, very easy. But simply put, the contribution areas for an air barrier, you're gonna play in energy and atmosphere, which is 19 of the 40 points you need for a certified building. You can play in the uh, material and you know, building reuse credit, IEQ, which is your thermal comfort design, and your indoor air quality. One of the big areas that I have been able to work throughout, and my offices go from Atlanta to California. One of the big areas I've been involved in is restoration. Taking an existing building, making it more energy efficient, making it more lead-like. And by having the air barrier applied to the inside and putting the continuous insulative sheathing inside, reversing the wall. When you're using a breathable system, you can do that very easily. And we've taken several buildings in San Antonio that were old buildings and made them LEED certified and a better building. Since LEED requires, relies on ASHRAE 90.1-2010, LEED's in there this year, LEED's gonna require air barriers. So you have all the codes changing, you have the lead program changing, everything that's green is going to the air barrier and continuous insulative sheathing. How to properly write the specification? There's a couple ways. I've had the pleasure of working with many of you now for 25 years. The specs are on my website. They contain everything that I spoke about today. There's at least three if not five manufacturers. So you can have at it, I've done that work already. But 
Specify carefully. Make sure you have the air barrier test in there. Call out for specimen two. Because if you don't call out for specimen two, they can give you specimen one or three, which are flat walls, no penetrations. We had one manufacturer claiming and thumping his chest that he had met this test using 10 mils wet on the wall, six mils dry. His testing on tilt up. Not a lot of air goes through tilt up. It's one of those funny phenomena. So once again, research well. Make sure your air barrier is fully tested and listed at the ABAA. Not, not for any other reason, it's a good quality control check, it's a good credibility check, and all those other test criteria which are important to the architectural community, like nail, nail sealability, they're there already. It's there. All these things are gonna be part of what is going on with LEED also. Submittals, you all know what to require in your submittals, but request the documentation. That's on the checklist also. And right here, do not proceed with the installation of the air barrier, membrane, and through wall flashing prior to a pre-installation conference. This is where it gets all screwed up. That is a technical term, all screwed up. Every job I've been involved in involves coordination between the trades. You now have got to coordinate between your insulation contractor, your mason, your waterproofer, your roofer, it's a mess. You have to pull them all into the meeting. Biggest areas I see missing, transitions between the roof line and the wall. That's all got to be sealed now. Transitions coming up from the ground. It's got to be sealed. And the bad thing is, say if you had, like this one here, which is an acrylic air barrier, and you had a roofer, and you were not talking amongst the people, and they bring a peel and stick membrane down onto your acrylic, Within two years, this will look like cottage cheese and will be a failure because those two materials are incompatible. So this is why you, you need to look at everything. Can you use a WR Grace um, window flashing with an acrylic? No. Can you use other products? No, you have to use what was tested. And they've taken that guesswork out of you. The products that were tested and are part of that system are listed for you already. So you don't have to worry about whether you're getting the compatibility. Do performance specifications. Have it listed properly. And once again, check and double check. Spray around your penetrations and projections if need be. Always check your flashings. And this is why the folks at the Office of Sustainability allow me to do this today because these things are intertwined. They're interrelated, they're almost married. And you can't do one without the other. And that's it. I am allowed to take, am I still on time? Yes. I am allowed to take questions at this point, but literally, what you see there is what's here, and I was presented 10 years ago. CSI and AIA call that the wall that works everywhere. Yes? Uh, obviously, we've been talking about air barrier and not vapor barriers. Right. That wall there set up does not have a vapor barrier. Right. Or the blue. Uh, that, right. Is felt paper a good material to use on air barriers? No, felt paper, I can tell you what doesn't meet. CMU block, felt paper, many house wraps, um, perlite, expanded polystyrene are not air barriers. Okay. So not. Particular type, uh, yes, it's very highly engineered materials. That is correct. And why is that? Because of the thermal leaks through the stud. Oh, it's, it's a system of function. That is correct. And that's been known since 2006 also. Look, I don't have a life, okay? I read this stuff. I'll make myself clear. I have ex-wives. That's plural. Why should I go out on Saturday night anymore? No need to. I'm going to read, and that's what I do, very honestly. But the thermal leaks goes back to the HVAC people. It's in their code, too. They've got a, I think it's called effective R value now in your code. It's a thermal breaking. Right. If you blow through the metal studs, all the wood studs, so that's what we're talking about. And that's the joke. insulation which is not breaking, but the metal will conduct. 
And I know that both of your firms have had that presentation already, and I'll be giving it again here July 25th. So that's what's been called the perfect wall. This is the wall that's introduced, except now it's flawed. And it's flawed because it used an asphaltic material. You now have to use a non-asphaltic material in the wall. The different products out there, cost comparison. And here, here's the better cost comparison. This is rough numbers from Dallas-Fort Worth. And you're looking at cost of material on the job site per 100 square foot. And that's just the data that was generated by some folks up in Dallas because that's always a question down here. Yes? Say that again. What's not an air barrier? CMU, self-paving, what else? Perlite, Perlite. expanded polystyrene, many different house wraps. There's actually a white paper on my website that I wrote about four years ago that addresses that issue, and it's from the two leading experts in air barriers, uh, Joe Lesturbic and Wagdi Anis. But I want to make sure, as an audience, that we're clear. Air barriers can be a vapor retarder, which means a perm rating above 1.0, or a vapor barrier, which is a perm rating below 1.0. It's not vapor that's the problem, it's air pushing into the building. Now you come down to a decision point on your job, and that decision point is basically right here. The code, whether you want to realize it or not, requires you to use extruded polystyrene. If you read it well, it calls for three quarter inch material minimum outside, and that R value's got to be 3.75. There's only one material that has that rating, and that's extruded polystyrene. You know there's Dow Styrofoam, which is blue, Owens Corning Fumular, which is pink, or the um, Pactive material, which is green. If you have over one inch, you have a vapor barrier now. You have a perm rating below 1.1. If you had two vapor barriers here, you're going to trap moisture inside, right? You're going to trap moisture. So you have to have one of these surfaces be breathable. So the logical choice is to make the air barrier the moisture vapor transmission point because this isn't going to change. If you use two inches of this, which is standard in the valley, you're going to wind up having a perm rating of 0 0.8, a super vapor barrier. What you've now done, though, is the dew point, as it occurs, is occurring in the drainage plane, no matter what the conditions down here, is occurring in the drainage plane. Not in the wall and not in the foam plastic, in the drainage plane, and it falls right down because the insulation is semi-independently adhered. Plenty of room for the water to work its way down, and last time I checked, only at Schlitterbahn does the water run uphill. So we have that consideration. So that design has been the standard down here for just about the last 10 years without a problem. 